Well, good evening, folks. It's uh, time for our Wednesday night Bible study again. It's Wednesday, uh, September the 16th, and we're just uh, really glad that you've had the opportunity to join with us tonight. It's a blessing to, to be with you. And so uh, tonight we're going to uh, continue in our study in the book of John. We'll be finishing up the 16th chapter tonight. And so uh, I think it'll be a blessing for all of us as we study God's Word. I know it always is for me. So we're, again, we're glad that you're here, glad to have you with us tonight. Uh, so go ahead and get your Bibles out to John, the 16th chapter, beginning in verse 25. We're going to be talking about tonight the virtues of a Christian. What are the virtues of a child of God as a, as a Christian? And, and when we talk about virtues, really what we're what we're looking at is uh, uh, qualities or traits that uh, uh, that as far as society would be concerned especially would be deemed as as uh, morally good it's things that we do traits that we have uh, the way we act our character or characteristics that are deemed morally good uh, those are considered virtues and so as we think about virtues of a Christian tonight, uh, keep that kind of definition in your mind. Today's world that we live in, uh, I think probably one of the, the great questions, and I think this will fall in place for us as we continue tonight as we look at virtues, but I think one of the great questions we have is, what is truth? Uh, I have never seen a time in our society when people were trying to find out the truth and it was more difficult to find the truth than, than we have today. Uh, I think uh, sometimes, and I'm not being critical of our news media or anyone else, but I think there's a, there's a, there's a terminology going around uh, about what we call fake news. And it's kind of um, stemmed from the fact that we just have a hard time even with our news media, whether it be uh, social media, or the television news, paper, newspaper, or written print, whatever it is, we seem to have a problem believing what we're reading or believing what we're hearing. And uh, in this Postmodernism society that we live in. I think there's a there's another term that kind of we hear a lot. I said we hear this term fake news a lot, but we hear another term, and it's uh, it's uh, that truth is a relative term. It, what is truth? And so uh, I, I thought it kind of ironic as as I've watched the the news lately, and uh, one of our local news channels here in the 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 Memphis area uh, has um, had put a new segment on. It's called Verify. Now I find that a little bit ironic uh, from the standpoint that you can call in or you can text in and ask the news people to verify the news. Well, isn't that kind of ironic that you that you can ask the news media to verify what they've said? You would think that they would not put anything out there in the news that they hadn't already verified to start with. And so uh, I just find it a little humorous that we can call and check on the news to make sure it's not fake news and we do that by contacting the news media so uh, in this world we live in is just uh, it's just another example of how ironic it is to try to find truth in a society of postmodernism society that believes truth is a relative term I think when we talk about this idea of truth uh, uh, we we find that uh, that facts and verifying facts and public knowledge and you know, the kind of things that kind of begin to bind us all together to where we think of news or information as verifiable or rational. And uh, I think uh, that's one of the things that we look at. I think there's a couple of things that society looks at when it looks at uh, the idea 
of uh, truth, and, and that is, is it factual? Can it be rationalized? Can we, can we bring it into our, our little, encapsulate it into our little world so that we can kind of justify it in our own hearts, in our own minds, uh, through fact or what we consider fact and through uh, just what we would consider public knowledge. That's one way. On the other hand, I think the, there's, uh, uh, in, in this world that we live in, uh, we have another way that we view the truth, and that's a, a more private way, a more subjective way, uh, a way that's a more, what matters is our personal preference. So, it's not again so much as the reality of truth is, but what do I want truth to be? What is my personal preference? You know, we live in a me society. It's all about me. It's it's what I want. It's what works for me. It's what uh, is good for me. And the truth, when we talk about the truth, is the the same way. It's well, it's true if I want to make it true. It's true if I want to believe it's true. Well, neither one of these ideas is really practical or rational or even verifiable, as we, we see in our uh, verifying the news. None of, these, none of these really work when you start trying to, to, to figure out what truth really is. And the, the consequences of not being able to establish truth or that we've, we've uh, rationalized truth so much and we've personalized truth so much, we don't really know what it is. And by not having truth, what we find ourselves is in a world really of hopelessness and despair. And I think that's where we find most of our society today. People yearn, I believe, are yearning for significance and meaning and purpose in their lives. And you, can't, you cannot find meaning or significance or purpose in the worldview the way uh, people see it. Uh, so... Uh, it's no wonder there's a level of frustration and a level of hopelessness in, in, in our society when we, we desire meaning and we desire significance and we desire purpose. In our, everybody needs to feel needed. Everybody needs to feel wanted. Everybody needs to feel like they have a purpose in their lives, but it's hard to find that when you can't establish what truth is and what what that looks like in our life. People people are desperately looking for something to believe in. I, I think that in today's world, we we look for things that we can believe in, and it's harder and harder to find um, uh, things that we can believe in. So, what's happened? What's happened in our world? The worldly pleasures have become our goal uh, to try to accomplish meaning in our life, to try to accomplish significance in our life, to try to accomplish purpose in our life. We look to worldly pleasures, and that, that has become, for many people in our world, a tireless pursuit to find worldly pleasures that make us happy and what we find is that all the worldly pleasures never, ever satisfies. So when we think about this idea of, of what will satisfy us, what will satisfy us is hope. That we have a hope in, in, in the future, a hope for us. The, the, that when we, when we think about hope, we have to, to think about a genuine love and a, a, an experience, a, a true sense of love and purpose in our life. And that love and purpose in our lives, for, for us as children of God, we understand and we, we realize that, that we can encapsulate the word love in and through Jesus Christ. We know that that our hope rests in Jesus Christ, that our future rests in Jesus Christ, that our sense of worth is in Jesus Christ. The scripture says there's nothing good about me as I'm just a sinner saved by grace, but I have the Holy Spirit that indwells within me that gives me great value. And so I have meaning, I have purpose, I have significance in and through Jesus Christ who indwells within me. And so when you see a life with no hope, with no purpose, with no meaning, no significance, it's because 
they do not know Jesus. So when we look at what a Christian looks like and we look at Christian virtues, remember what we said about Christian virtues. There are those things, those characteristics, those traits that even the world would see as morally correct and morally good. And I, I want us to look at three of, based on the scripture we're going to, to, to read, I want us to see three of those uh, virtues that I think sum up a Christian life, a Christian walk. And, and those three virtues are faith, hope, and love. Those three things are central to a Christian faith. They're central to a Christian walk. Faith, hope, and love are essentials. They're essential traits, essential characteristics, essential virtues to living a Christian life. And it's that kind of Christian life that's, that uh, we want to talk about tonight. It's those kind of uh, underlying virtues that, that as the as we look at the Word of God, they, they are revealed to us. So what we see tonight is Jesus' final teaching <clears throat> to the disciples. We've been talking for, for several, several weeks now about uh, this last evening before Jesus was to go to the cross and how he has been trying to share with the disciples the fact he's going away, the fact he's going to the cross, even to the fact that he is going to send back the Holy Spirit. Now remember we said they didn't understand exactly what he was saying and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on tonight. But this, this is the last time Jesus addressed the disciples uh, in a way that tries to bring information, comfort, hope, strength, all of those essential things that the disciples and even as we talk about virtues tonight, hope, love, and faith, those things he tries to bring to the disciples so that they are not only ready, but they're prepared to do the job that God has called them to do. So as we, as we continue to see Jesus comforting the, the disciples, Jesus reassures them of the Father's love for them and he bolsters their sagging faith and held out hope for a future for them. And understanding the, the hope that we have for us is in the ultimate victory we find in Jesus Christ. So let's look at the scripture for just a few minutes tonight. And let's see if we can break it down into three characteristics, love, faith, and hope. So let's begin in John, the 16th chapter, beginning in verses 25 through 27. And let's look for just a minute at this idea of love as far as Jesus trying to speak to the disciples this one last time. So beginning in verse 25, he says tonight, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, and hours coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I will do. And I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from the Father." So let's look at this idea of love for just a second. And we've already established the fact that, that as Jesus is talking to the disciples, and we've talked about this several weeks, that they don't always understand what Jesus is telling them. So that's an established fact. They don't understand what Jesus is telling them. But we also have to understand that that much of what Jesus has told them, much of what Jesus is telling them, is going to become clear in their lives in and through the Holy Spirit who will be their helper, their guide, after Jesus ascends back to the Father. So let's remember that even for them it was hard to understand because <clears throat> remember this was all brand new. These were all first-time events. 
They had not seen Jesus go to the cross before. They had not seen Jesus die on the cross. They had not seen Jesus be put into a borrowed tomb. And they certainly were not aware of Jesus' resurrection on the third day and his ascension back to the Father. They were not aware of this. Even though Jesus had told them this was going to happen, it's hard to understand things that you've never seen before. Imagine in your own life something that's, that you saw or that somebody's telling you about that you've never seen before, that you've never heard of before, and how difficult it is to see those things. It's kind of like someone who has lost their eyesight, someone who is, especially if they've been blind from birth, it's very difficult to, to tell them and explain to them what a flower looks like. If I've ever seen a flower, then, I, then you can explain to me a different kind of flower and I can get a better picture. But if, if I've never seen a flower, it's hard for me to understand and to grasp the beauty of a flower. Well, they, they had their eyes were not open fully yet. And they would not be open fully until the coming of the Holy Spirit. Love that is mentioned here is the language as we, as we look at this idea of love. It's the language of obedience. God requires us to be obedient to him. And the demonstration of our love for God is our obedience to him. The Father mo motive for allowing believers access to Him, and that's what Jesus was telling them, is one day I won't have to, to talk to the Father directly because you will be. You'll be doing it yourself. And, and that full demonstration of God's love, that's where it, it comes to fruition as we are able to talk to the Father ourselves. We're able to communicate. God's love, when we fully understand and grasp and, and grab a hold of the magnitude of God's love, uh, the only way we can do that is through Scripture. Remember, the Scripture says that God loves sinners and that all of us at one time in our life were lost and without, without Jesus Christ we were we were living in sin. We're still sinners simply saved by grace. But God loves the sinner. And he loved the sinner so much that even while we were lost in our sins, the scripture says that Jesus sent his son. John 3.16 describes it perfectly for us when he says, For God so loved what? The world. What does the world consist of? The world consists of lost humanity. He says, but even while the world was lost, he says that I sent, that I gave my only begotten son, that whosoever, not, not a select few, not a chosen, but whosoever believes in me should not perish, but have eternal life. That's love, folks. That's love. When God loved us so much that even when we didn't love him, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. That's, that's love. So the, the first virtue we see, we see love. Next, let's look for just a moment at faith. And we see faith as we look at verses 28 through 32. We're going to see faith. He says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. And I'm leaving the world again, going to the Father. I came into the world. The Father sent me into the world. And the Father is going to take me out of this, this world. He says, I'm leaving this world again, going back to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need of anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. By this we believe that you came from God. By this we have seen our faith come to fruition. 
Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Now remember, the disciples, with everything that was fixing to happen, the one thing they surely didn't understand is that when Jesus left, they were being left with a job to do. Every one of them was going to have to go out on his own and be a disciple for Christ. Every one of them needed to understand that their strength, their love, their hope, their faith all came from Christ. He says, I'm going away. And he says, he says, and you're going to go away and you're going to do your own thing and you're going to leave, you're going to think you're leaving me alone. But he says, and yet I'm not alone because I have the Father with me. Despite whatever pessimism or skepticism that uh, we may encounter about the truth, all people, all people exercise a great measure of human faith. When we look at truth and we have a, a hard time understanding truth, just remember uh, that for us, a great measure of human faith is, when we look at faith, is in the mundane things of the, of the world, the mundane matters of everyday life. You see, people trust and have faith in certain things. We trust that we eat what we eat and the things that we eat are okay for us, that they're, they're not going to poison us or kill us, that we can eat the food that we eat and it's okay. We trust that the water that we drink is going to be okay, that we can drink this water and it'll, it'll revive us, it'll give us the, 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 the liquid nourishment that we need and it's not going to harm us. We have, we have faith in the medicines that we take that it's going, to, that it's going to be safe to take those medicines. We have faith that when we get on an airplane, that that airplane's not going to crash, that that airplane is going to land. And we have faith that when it lands, it's going to land in the right place and, and not in the wrong city. We, we have faith in, in a house that we, we live in, that that house is not going to collapse on top of us. We put faith in so many mundane things. Many people even put faith in a in a higher level. The people believe that in, in things like they believe in themselves. They believe in love. They believe in money. They believe in all sorts of things. Even into this nebulous thinking of a higher, higher power. Now they don't believe in who God is and, and they they don't both understand God, but many believe in this higher power. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and and really, what I'm going to I'm going to read a statement he made, but it's such a vague statement. But but listen to what he said about faith. He said, "It faith is something in faith in something and enthusiasm for something." that makes life worth living. In other words, he says, it's faith in something or enthusiasm for something that makes life worth living. Well, that is a poor, flimsy credo for us. I mean, if you think about that, that's one of those statements we hear people say, it doesn't matter what you believe in, as long as you're fervent in your, in your belief of that, that is absolutely not true. Oliver Wendell Holmes' statement is absolutely not true. It's not faith in something or enthusiasm in something. It's faith in God. And in contrast to such a statement that Holmes made, uh, what you find is aimlessness and and. and this, this malcontent or discontent feeling. But people who, who have faith in Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, are firmly rooted in the love of God, and that, that love of God is manifested in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not 
that God's love is demonstrated over and over and over again. And God's love is, is ultimately demonstrated in Jesus Christ and recorded in the scripture for us. It's the kind of love that we can grab a hold of. It's the kind of faith that we can put our faith in Jesus Christ knowing he loves us. We don't have to have faith in, in something. We have faith in the greatest thing that, that was ever created. That's Jesus Christ. We have faith in God who is the great creator, the, the Lord God. We have faith in, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit uh, who created all things, who made us the created beings that God created, uh, have a desire and an emptiness in our hearts to, to need something, and that something was Jesus. So we see love, we see faith, and we end our study tonight with hope. Look what it says in verse 33. John, the, the last verse, the 16th chapter, he says, and these things, everything I've told you, everything I've spoken to you is so that in me you may find peace. What is one of the hardest things in the world we live in for you and I to find today? I mean, the world's a mess. You know it. I know it. Just look around us. There's turmoil everywhere. There's trouble everywhere. There's, there's storms everywhere. Today, a, a massive storm hit the coast of Florida uh, around the, the, the Gulf Shores area where many of, of, of our folks uh, spend their vacation time. Matter of fact, we have some of our folks who went down there. Uh, I haven't heard uh, their status right now, but they're, they're going through a great storm there. And that storm, that turmoil, that tumultuous seas that are billowing back and forth. That's the way life is for us. And our only hope rests in Jesus. And, and our only peace rests in Jesus. Look at what he says. These things I've spoken to you. I've, I've told you all the stuff in the entire chapter 16, 14, 15, 16. He said, I've been telling you, he says, so that in me, in me, when the world around you is collapsing in me, you may have peace. Now listen, listen to what the word says. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Greater is he that is in me than is he that is in the world. Did you hear what the, the word of the Lord said? He said, he said take take. Take hope, take love, take faith that in me I'm going to bring you peace. I love this song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. O oh Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My hope, my hope, my love, my faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Amen. Well, understanding God's love and placing one's faith in him, the things of which Christ has just spoken to the disciples brings peace for the disciples, brings peace despite the hostility of the world, brings peace to us. Despite the hostility of the world, or despite the re relentless tribulation that's going on around us, it brings peace. Despite the, the storm, the, despite the hurricane that's, that's raging in, in people's lives, Christ can bring peace. The peace and the hope that characterize the disciples in the same peace and hope that can characterize us, every believer in every age. I think it's significant that Jesus' last words to his disciples in the upper room before praying for them and departing for Gethsemane were words of love, faith, and hope. In the face of their greatest trial 
in the next few days, the Lord reminded them of those three foundational truths, truths that would subsequently mark their ministry for the rest of their lives and also mark all the saints to follow them. Those are the characteristics, those are the virtues that mark you and I as a child of God. Love, faith, and hope. Now Jesus, having done all of these things, he next, he begins to pray. So next week, you don't want to miss next week. Next week, week as we begin chapter 17, we look at one of the most dynamic, beautiful prayers that we have in the scripture is Jesus prays. God bless you for being with us tonight. Don't forget to be back with us next Wednesday night as we start chapter 17. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Keep safe and share Jesus with somebody that he puts in your path. God bless.